6 o'clock news starts right now. He's being held on a single parole violation for a nonviolent offense. And while hundreds of other Bear County inmates have been released in recent weeks to help limit the potential spread of COVID-19, this man with a serious health condition remains in jail. Tonight, his attorney telling our J Dylan Collier that despite his pleas, no one is budging. <laughs> On the same day, Bear County jail officials announced that 10 inmates have now tested positive for the deadly coronavirus in less than a week. Attorney Trey Moore stood on a downtown street corner. He's stuck there. Describing the bureaucratic red tape that has kept his client in custody at that facility during a global pandemic. Narciso Garcia, a military veteran, was on parole for a felony drug conviction taking college courses and abiding by the rules of his release when late last year, according to Moore, he suffered a mental health episode and missed a meeting with his parole officer. State authorities issued a warrant for Garcia's arrest and he's been in custody since early February. He was essentially out of pocket for one month and voluntarily turned himself in. Adding to Garcia's current plight, he suffers from Guillain-Barre syndrome, a flare-up of which, according to WebMD, would cause his immune system to start attacking his own nerves. Garcia's continued incarceration comes as hundreds of other nonviolent offenders have walked out of jail since last month. While Moore says his client continues to languish inside the Bear County Jail, it will actually be up to the state to decide whether or not to release Garcia. Sheriff's officials confirming they are unable to release Garcia because his warrant was issued by the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, but said all inmates in their custody do receive medical care. At a parole hearing held at the jail early this month, according to Moore, Garcia was ordered to spend 45 days at an intermediate sanctioned facility. But with the state not currently accepting inmate transfers, his stint in Bear County continues. It's a very scary situation for all of the, uh, the people in, in jail right now. If this COVID-19 goes through the jail population, uh, it's going to strain all of the hard work that this city has done. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Moore has filed a motion to have his client's hearing status reopened. The defenders reached out to the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles, and this was their response. If a request is submitted by an attorney, a response will be provided to that attorney. A San Antonio City Councilman looking for a way to delay evictions even longer. There's currently a moratorium on eviction hearings, but some people may still be getting what are called notices to vacate. Councilman Roberto Trevino has also asked the city to look into crafting an ordinance that would require landlords to give a notice of proposed eviction at least 60 days before providing such a notice. Austin has instituted a similar ordinance. And it allows for uh, renters to have basically a 60 day grace period to to cure their rent that gives them some time to pay back the rent that is owed. It's it's not a, for a forgiveness. It's simply buying time. The top city staffer said they are still looking into the idea and exactly how to craft it. The doctor behind a new experimental COVID-19 treatment here in San Antonio says preliminary studies show it seems to be working. The treatment involves giving sick patients plasma from up from former patients, which means donors are needed in order to help more people. Devin Clark with information on how the treatment works and how to become a donor or a recipient. So it's actually readily available right now, so we were lucky enough for the FDA to prove it for uh, approve it for emergency use. An experimental COVID-19 treatment that began in China is now being used here in San Antonio after showing positive results in patients overseas. Their fevers resolved quicker, their x-ray findings improved, um, overall they felt better, and in some of these studies they found there was a, a signal um, towards improved survival. Chief of Medicine at Methodist Hospital Texan, Dr. Bravin Amalakouin, is at the forefront of the new effort locally. It involves taking plasma from former patients. They need to be 28 days from the time of their first symptoms, um, and then they can donate blood, because then we could reasonably, reasonably kind of um, assume that they would have enough antibodies in their blood to um, attack the COVID-19 virus. Antibody-rich blood plasma can then be given to COVID-19 patients who are very sick. The requirements are you need to be admitted to an acute care facility 
and you need to be in respiratory failure. One local woman says the treatment is working for her husband. He was taken off of a ventilator just days after receiving a plasma transfusion. While the studies are preliminary, with more donors, Dr. Amala Kuhn says he believes there will be more success stories. Dr. Amala Kuhn says there is a high need for donors. If you'd like to be screened or if you're a patient that would like to receive plasma, just visit ksat.com for information. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. He knew at six he was convicted on drug charges in January and chose to have the judge, not the jury, set his punishment. When Daniel Zambrano was sentenced to 10 years in prison yesterday, he was in jail. His lawyer, the judge, and prosecutors were all at home. Paul Venema takes us to a felony sentencing here with everyone involved working remotely. This is where, until the pandemic, Judge Catherine Torres Stahl presided over felony trials as state district court judge. This is cause number 2019. That's all changed now. Her home has become her courtroom, her staff, attorneys, and defendants all joining her remotely through a program called Zoom. On this day, she sentenced Daniel Zambrano and co-defendant Anthony Mireles on felony drug charges. From your standpoint, what this is, what this whole process has been like. It's plowing a lot of new ground technically and legally. We've done things a certain way for a very long period of time. And so we have to kind of step back and figure out, you know, confidentiality issues, uh, document sharing. Tony Stahl said though judicial considerations are a priority, she's also concerned about the safety of the public. So working remote makes good sense. As for feedback from defendants. It seemed that they were fine with the process. Uh, there was uh, somebody that was working with them at the jail. And is there any other legal reason why Mr. Midellis cannot be sentenced today? Though working remote is a necessity in this pandemic, Torres Stahl says it'll likely be used to some degree when we return to normal. Will we ever see you on the bench again? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I sure do hope so. Uh, I definitely miss the courtroom and I definitely uh, miss all the interaction with, uh, you know, everyone in the courtroom. Paul Venema, uh, KSAT however, 12 News. In this ever-changing coronavirus landscape, medical personnel are operating under a rapid fire of new information. Those on the front lines across the country are sharing what they're learning, which each week amounts to a mountain of facts. Ursula Perry spoke with one local doctor whose webinars are likely saving lives. So I just wanted to touch on some updates of what we know about pregnancy. Dr. Patrick Ramsey is a maternal fetal medicine specialist at UT Health who stars weekly in a special webinar every Friday. Uh, but we know from SARS and MERS that there are theoretic concerns that can be worse and flu is the same way. This is how he's able to share what he's learned as cases of COVID-19 arrive at University Hospital, as well as from nationwide forums and research gathered by fellows at UT Worldwide. Questions about well, what do you think about this? Uh, approach or we're doing this and what are other people doing and we get this really robust discussion group going on about what might be working at one place that may not work at another and how can we align efforts to have better practice for everybody. The recommendations are constantly changing and there's still so much to learn about how COVID-19 affects pregnancy and birth. But even just this week, a major discovery at Columbia University. Now look, they started screening all pregnant women coming in for scheduled deliveries or C-sections, and they noted that uh, a significant proportion of those women were negative, on a, uh, didn't have symptoms, but they actually tested positive. Keep in mind that Columbia University's study involved pregnant women who were carrying COVID along with their baby with no symptoms at all. No doubt this week's webinar is going to be very interesting. It also makes the case that universal testing is probably going to be needed. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Best known for its whiskey and other spirits, Maverick Distillery on Broadway is now bottling a different brand of alcohol. Not the kind you drink, although that's still being sold curbside, but rather the kind you rub on your hands. Jesse Degriato says the distillery is now included in a new campaign in response to COVID-19's impact on the community. Hashtag support local. A bank a century ago that turned into a distillery with ties to a historic family by Samuel Maverick's great-great-grandson and his wife is now doing this. 
producing hand sanitizer. And when the need arose, we decided to make the switch. Both being physicians, she says they know the importance of hand sanitizer. Only problems so far. The supply chain um, is difficult right now, so getting all of the supplies that we need, the ingredients, has been tough. Even so, Maverick Distillery's employees are trying to keep up with demand. Much of the hand sanitizer being donated to first responders and others. Obviously, there's a need, and people are so very thankful to have the hand sanitizer. Thank you. And the public has been immensely grateful uh, for the opportunity to be able to buy it as well. The video about the distillery and its historic background Ground is part of the IMG Studios hashtag support local, a campaign that's needed more than ever, says its founder and CEO. We decided to do what we do best, and that is tell stories in a way to help nonprofits and local businesses. In doing so, she says her employees keep their jobs, creating the videos for use on social media and elsewhere. So I feel like it's a, a duty really for all of us to step up as community members and do whatever we can to help out others. Jesse Degollado. KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam. We've had a string of beautiful days, but I gotta say, today's been my favorite. It has. It's so nice. You know where we're where we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be doing today? Yeah. Fiesta Fiesta. That's Fiesta. right. Yep. Yep. Very true. Adam. Yes, we uh, don't don't mention it. I know it's a beautiful day too to have Fiesta Fiesta, but we're gonna bring our own little Fiesta at home here. Coming up next half hour here in the uh, Casa de Caski. Aquifers down a little bit today. We're still well above average for this time of year. As for the pollen count, it's nice because oak is not even in the pollen count right now. Just mold, pecan, and grass all low. Cold front hits, clouds, and a chance of rain. We'll talk about it coming up. A total of 918 confirmed positive COVID-19 cases in our community. Uh, that's up uh, slightly from yesterday. Uh, a total, thankfully, of 176 individuals have now fully recovered in our community. That's quite a big jump from yesterday. I'm also happy to report that there have been no new deaths to report today from COVID-19. Our hospital situation continues to look strong. Tonight we have 76 patients uh, in the hospital. That's down from yesterday. In addition, we have an, uh, 39 people under investigation, meaning that they're in the hospital awaiting test results. That's also down. Also down is the number of people uh, on ventilators. So we are reporting 30 uh, folks uh, with COVID-19 are on ventilators tonight. That has decreased. Overall, we have 76% of ventilator capacity available to us, as well as 40% of available hospital bed capacity. Uh, I also want to note tonight, and Doc, uh, Judge Wolf will be talking a little bit more about this. Uh, he and I have both updated our emergency declarations tonight, most notably uh, to include mandatory face masks for folks over 10 years old who are out in public spaces and cannot keep social distancing. Um, that's critical to note because, um, as Dr. Wu will, will explain later, um, face coverings help make sure that folks who are carrying the virus and may have no symptoms or mild symptoms don't uh, pass it on to somebody else. So uh, that is effective. Um, Immediately, in, in three days, it will be effective for businesses who will then have to supply masks uh, for some of their employees who are also uh, up close uh, to customers, a lot of customer contact. Uh, judge Wolf will go a little bit more into detail on the order. Last thing I want to note before I hand it off to the judge is we also appointed today the COVID-19 health transition team, uh, which consists of medical experts in our community that will provide some guidance, specific scientific guidance to the court and to the council about transitioning out of our social distancing restrictions and possibly back into them if necessary if we see again um, outbreaks of this infectious disease. Uh, it will be chaired by Dr. Barbara Taylor of UT Health Science Center or UT Health San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Wu is also on that along with many other notable physicians and scientists in our community. Judge Wolf. Well, thank, thank you, Mayor. And first of all, let me Thank everybody in San Antonio, Bear County. And we're still doing better than other metropolitan areas in the state of Texas, and it's because all of you are working so hard to make sure that we don't infect someone else and that we're taking care of our loved ones. Now, we all have a little different array of uh, masks. I happen to have a scarf, 
and uh, uh, use that. It's easy to go up and down. And if you really want to be fashionable, my wife has been able to give me some nice scarves that she has uh, to, to wear around. So be sure and cover the face, uh, whether it's with a mask or whether it's with a scarf of some sort. Another important part of the order that we uh, both have uh, signed today is that we're requiring a 25% uh, spacing requirement in stores. Whatever they had before to be 25% of whatever they had before in this particular store that they're in. Now that's going to cover food, it's going to cover household staples and retail. And that's important. They're doing that at HEB. I had to stand outside about 10 minutes before I went in to make sure that we weren't overloading the store at any one given time. So that's going to be an important uh, safety measure under the two new orders that we did today. I'm really proud of the health task force that we've uh, that we've appointed. Uh, we've got a good cross section. There's three three people there. Mayor already mentioned one that are uh, that are with UT Health Science Center, and then we have two people from our Bear County Hospital District doing business at University Hospital. Dr. Brian Alsip and Dr. Jason Motto. So we got a very good team. They got a very, very difficult job ahead of them trying to plan, in addition to other things, trying to plan how we would phase in and what are the things that we need to do as we phase in. And the face mask is certainly uh, one of those and one. that's why we put that in place right here at this time. I want to uh, give a special thanks out there to Fernando Reyes and his family. They're also producing um, shields, uh, uh, face shields. I want to thank Reverends John and Matthew Hagee. They they've provided over 13,700 hot meals. They're also sending food to Haven for Hope. And they conducted a blood uh, drive that collected 101 units. Everybody is stepping up to really help on this. A short uh, summary of the jail. We don't have any new ones, but we have some tests that are pending, waiting the results of eight tests that are pending now. But we really stepped up our work there. University uh, Health System now is doing checks on every inmate two times a day, and that includes taking their temperatures. Where we're frustrated at, we have 185 people in our jail that should be in the Texas prison system. They're ready to go. We've met all the qualifications, but they're not picking them up. And if this continues, it's going to be a major problem for jails all across the state of Texas. Uh, so w w w we're on the right we're on the right track here now, and we're really doing a, a lot of great things. And then one quick note before I forget, uh, we have 26 other suburban cities, and uh, as we have worked hard toward this census count, uh, 21 of them have exceeded state total totals. And the city of Chavano Park, under Mayor Mayor Robert Werner, had the highest seventh highest response in the nation. So we all should keep up uh, with trying to make sure we get everybody signed up for this census. Right, thank you, Judge. And we're, we're going to go now to uh, questions. And I also remind folks that Dr. Wu here is also our local public health authority and can answer a lot of the technical questions uh, and also uh, talk about, a little bit about the authorities that we do have in terms of the metropolitan health response to this. So we'll go to questions now. Dr. Wu, um, as part of this health transition. Team, all right. Well, we've. Big bit of news there yeah. that the mayor and the county judge gave us just moments ago that all face coverings will be mandatory, effective immediately for people who are out in the public over 10 years of age in the city and in the county. Yeah, and in addition to that, businesses will have to supply masks. They're giving them a three day um, kind of time frame to get that in order, but businesses will have to supply masks to employees, especially those dealing with a lot of customers in and out of the facility. The other part of the um, emergency declaration that they're updating tonight is a 25% spacing requirement in stores. This is so you don't overload the stores and there's the proper amount of people within that uh, particular building. Yeah. So that could mean when you go to the grocery store, you may have to wait outside until the proper spacing is, is uh, made so you can come in. And so those are things that we're just going to have to get used to over the next few days. Also, uh, they have appointed a transition team headed by Dr. Barbara Taylor from UT Health San, San Antonio. She is a uh, infectious disease expert uh, and some others. Uh, again, we're at 918 confirmed cases, so we are over 900 today. But 176 people have recovered and no new deaths have been reported either. We're still at 37. Yeah, and the other bit of news that we will continue to monitor is the situation at the jail. Yeah. As the judge mentioned there, this is 
potentially problematic in the next few days because of the uh, number of inmates that are awaiting transfer. They have all the qualifications ready, but they're awaiting transfer to TDCJ facilities, and they're unable to do that because they're not accepting any inmates. And so that, as the judge mentioned, there will be a problem if this continues into the future. Yeah, they have eight pending tests at the jail that they're still waiting for, and every inmate checked two times a day. Some of the new things that the judge and Mayor Ron Nuremberg were talking about. All right, let's transition now. Let's talk about weather and check in with our good friend, Adam Kasky. I could, you know, it is Thursday, right? <laughs> Yes, it is. It's a Therm Thurs, all right. And we're going to be celebrating Thermometer Thursday and what would have been Viva Fiesta or Fiesta Fiesta here at the Caskey House, right? We're going to do it Fiesta at home and we're going to kick it off next half hour. It's going to be fun. We're going to make a mess. Oh, yes, we are. All right. Oh, thanks, honey. Here, my wife just brought me my mask. I wanted to show this with the uh, order. Isn't this cool? It's got a Star Wars design on it, right? Our uh, neighbor, Yanni Betts, made these. It's got a little pipe cleaner up top, too, so you can mold it around your nose. Very nice. Went to Costco today. Trust me, folks. You get over the awkwardness. You get over the awkwardness pretty quickly, and a lot of people are wearing them. It's good to see. I'd say about 75% of the folks out there were actually wearing their masks. All right, so we got to get through the forecast here. Obviously, big temperature changes. We go from 70s today and tomorrow down into the low 60s on Saturday, and then by Sunday, we'll see sunshine and get well into the 80s, even near 90 degrees. Right now, we're mostly in the 70s, 75 in San Antonio, 72 in Kerrville and Catula now at 78 degrees. So back to some low clouds and rain chances in the days ahead. Just increasing clouds out there right now. That's all we have. But as our future cast shows, low gray clouds developing tonight, lasting through Saturday, and with it, some spotty light showers, a few little sprinkles, light showers here and there. 62 in the morning tomorrow, then by the noon hour, we'll hit our high of 74. And then the cold front hits and temperatures drop, so we're only going to be in the low 60s for an afternoon high on Saturday with some isolated showers even lasting into the night. Then by Sunday, after some pockets of morning rain, it's actually looking pretty sunny and temperatures well into the 80s, even right near 90 degrees. Come on, there's the rest of your forecast for you. All right, next week, a lot of sunshine near 90. What would typically be fiesta weather? Back to you inside. All right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, thanks, Adam. We'll be right back. After missing six straight games with a shoulder injury, Spurs power forward the Marcus Aldridge returned to action March 10th. He scored 24 points to help the Spurs defeat the Mavs, and then the season was put on hold. It's been 37 days since the Spurs last played a game. L.A. spoke with NBA.com, and he was asked what he's been doing to stay in shape if the NBA decides to finish up the regular season. Quote, man, it's tough. I'm trying to work out at the house. I was going to the track, but they closed all the tracks down because people were hanging out there. So they closed down all the tracks. I'm just trying to ride the bike, the treadmill, just working out at the house. End quote. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys are continuing their virtual draft interviews and posting parts of those conversations <laughs> online. The boys are good at running back, but still chatted with LSU back Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who has something in common with Jerry and Stephen Jones. So the way I frog, I have a little, I have a flat bottom, all aluminum boat, and we'll go like in like this little slough, and they have frogs everywhere. And you wear a headlamp and you blind the frog and you're on the boat and all the way up until you get on the frog, just grab it, you grab it, put them in a cooler and then, uh, you know, later on, you know, you skin them and, and clean them and fry them or bake them or just do whatever you want to do with them. Uh, Steven was frogging. He had my, my dad's truck and was driving along the bank trying to get down near the water so he could shoot the frogs out of the bank. And the <laughs> truck just rolled off on over in the lake. <laughs> So my father had to come get Stephen with the truck out and uh, rolled over on his side in the lake. Froggy. Oh, man. Both you guys look froggy to me. <laughs> <laughs> 
If not for COVID-19, UTSA football will be getting ready to wrap up spring ball with the 10th annual Fiesta Spring Game this Saturday at Ferris Stadium. Instead, the Roadrunners are learning Coach Trailer's system online and trying to work out and stay in shape without their normal training facilities. Yesterday, we caught up with Roadrunner safety Rashad Wisdom while he was training for his sophomore campaign. We're going to take it step by step, you know, because nobody really knows how long it's going to last for or what, you know, what even the season is going to look like. So we're just taking it step by step and trying to maintain everything and, you know, stay in shape and still have meetings and be up to speed with the playbook and stay on top of our grades as well. Man, I'll tell you what, guys, I so miss football. I do too, but I, I did kind of like that whole frog. That whole frog. The whole frog and back and <laughs> right. forth thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Larry. You got it. Stay froggy. <laughs> we'll be right back. Separating the facts from the fear that are out there when it comes to coronavirus and COVID-19. As he does every Thursday, we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. Robert Frolichstein, an emergency room doctor locally here in town. Doctor, thank you for joining us. And like I ask you every time when we start, what's the current situation in the emergency room where you work? Adequate staff, adequate equipment. Are you seeing more patients? So uh, yeah, we're we're seeing a few more patients. Um, well, I guess let me start by saying our staff is healthy, and we're uh, proud to say really no persons in the emergency department has contracted the virus, uh, and that's uh, you know very encouraging. And um, we have seen a few more admissions. Uh, it's a kind of we're in a kind of a steady state in the system right now. In other words, the admissions are equaling the discharges. We've had some great success stories where patients have come in, been treated successfully for COVID, and then are now have been discharged to home. And that's a that's a great, very encouraging thing to see. Some amazing stories, and our ICU teams are doing some incredible work. Uh, it's great. That's very good news. Yeah, obviously this is uh, COVID-19 is something no one wants to get and certainly no one wants to find themselves in the hospital. In addition to that, should that happen, should folks find themselves or either themselves or a loved one in the hospital? Um, what are some of the things that patients and family members can do to be prepared? Should that happen? Yeah, so it's kind of a weird time, right? And, and there's no visitors uh, allowed in the hospitals right now. And, and that's certainly uh, is a very difficult situation for the, for the families, for the patients, and for for us as well. The nurses and the doctors caring for the patients. Part of our job is to to connect with the family and the patient in a, in a empathetic way, and that's really hard to do when your family's not there. Obviously, and what we're trying to do is is uh, do that through phone um, updates through through the phone very frequently. Um, but in preparation to come in, into the emergency department, uh, this is especially important if you have a loved one that because of an acute or chronic medical condition is unable to do a great job given their own history. It's important to, um, first of all, learn to use the phone, learn to use video chat. And uh, that will be important to communicate with us and, and important to communicate with your loved one. Um, it's important to develop a list of medications, allergies, medical conditions, and, and the physicians uh, that you're being treated by and bring that with you to the emergency department. What are, what are the, what's the process? Uh, let's say, you know, I show up and I think I have a broken arm. Are, are, am I going to be greeted by somebody in this personal protective equipment with, with the face shield and, and all of that, no matter what condition I'm in when I come into the emergency room? So it varies a little bit by which facility um, you go to, but in some of our facilities, you're actually greeted by uh, an emergency physician via iPad. We have an iPad at the entranceway and you chat with that person uh, very quickly. Other places you do chat with uh, usually a nurse that is in um, personal protective equipment and the, the goal of that initial conversation is really to determine if, if you have symptoms suggestive of COVID, even if it is a broken arm. If you have symptoms suggestive of COVID, then you are rerouted. You're routed to a different waiting area, although frankly, the, there's no wait right now and you'll be into a, a separate area of the emergency department. And if, if there are no symptoms consistent with COVID, 
there's a different area of the emergency department that you're you're taken to. Yeah, going back to the topic of being prepared and not to get too personal here, but uh, you know, personally speaking, I had a death in the family last week. It was my grandmother. And one of the things that she had in place were her wishes for end of life, that she wanted to die at home and, and a, a list of things that us as her family members, um, you know, that we, we that she wanted us to, to follow. Is this a conversation, even for healthy folks, that people should be having right now with their family and their loved ones? Absolutely. And it is, it is not hard. I mean, not ever easy. It's never easy to have those conversations. Um, even in times, pre-COVID times, uh, it, the emergency department is never a great place to have those conversations. So it's always helpful to have those conversations in, in advance of the need to have them. It's especially difficult to have those conversations now. Um, it's hard to have those conversations on the phone. Um, with 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 family members, um, but we've we've had to do it in numerous times. Um, so it's much better to have a plan, have a have this discussed. Call your personal physician, make these kind of decisions well in advance of the need for them. And just really quickly, I know my producer's telling us to wrap, but really quickly, what what is it that you would need as the phys physician treating these folks in terms of a, an order or anything like that? What specifically would you need? Well, really, we want to know your wishes. Um, and if you are faced with a life-threatening situation that it appears at your end of your life, we would want to know how you want to be treated. Do you want to be on a ventilator? Do you want us to do CPR? Those are things that are typically defined in a DNR order, um, but there's other resources available. There's uh, um, um, different documents that define further what, how you'd like to be treated towards the end of your life. Okay. Doctor, I don't know if we can say this enough, but thank you for all that you're doing and for the people that you're working with in the entire healthcare community. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you tonight at nine. We're going to answer some of the viewer questions uh, that seem to be wide ranging this in this day and age. So Dr. Robert Froelichstein, thank you for your time as always. All right. My pleasure. We'll be right back. If for a lot of people, daily life has kind of gotten like Groundhog Day, the movie, remember that? Well, this seems like a perfect time for something like this to come along. Video of a groundhog going to town on a piece of pizza. <laughs> Kristen Chalela Bagnell spotted this guy right outside her home in Philadelphia. Oh my goodness. He seems pretty content with the way things are going, kind of oblivious to the dogs watching him through the window and everything else that's going on. The groundhog took his time with that slice about an hour before taking off. Look, he's just facing down the dogs. It almost looks like he's taunting them. Yeah. Bagnell says the animal has been seen around the neighborhood before, but this was the first time for their personal pizza party. Yeah, he's definitely yeah. rubbing it in. I love there, that. He's got the pizza. Live look outside with live cam. 75 degrees out there, and uh, it's just a beautiful day. Wish we could have more days like this. And you know, at 5 o'clock, we miss the uh, Kasky, you know, Cas Cascarone? Yeah. The cannon? The cannon, that's, there we go. Yeah, and, you know, I hope Canyon Cascarone. Is that what it is? I, I don't remember what he dubbed it. I don't remember, Adam. It's El Canyon de Cascarone. That's what she is, and lock and loaded. Look at that. Ready to go. Nothing but confetti. Caskey family's going to kick off Fiesta at home in just a few minutes. Yeah, tomorrow's gonna be nothing like today. We'll have a lot of clouds overhead. We'll have a few little showers here and there, gray and dreary. We'll make it into the 70s before a cold front hits and then temperatures plummet into Saturday. We'll talk about everything coming right up. All right, it was a beautiful day out there. It would have been the first day of Fiesta, yeah. but um, we'll have to wait till November. Hopefully November is kind to us and has some good weather like today I or like we've had this April. I don't know if it can top a day like today, but we, yeah. can, we can remember Fiesta even though it's still a few months off, even though we should be at Hemisphere right now, Adam Kasky. Yeah, we should be. Normally we'd be out shaking hands, giving hugs, cracking cascarones on heads, taking selfies, and all be crammed together at Hemisphere instead. We're all at home.
But at KSAT, we will be bringing last year's parades to you, streaming uh, on your OTT platform, computer, mobile device, and even on air on KSAT 12. So you can catch that action. And we're going to have a little Viva Fiesta fun here uh, coming up in a couple of minutes. First, let's talk weather. We have some changes to talk about. Oh, look at that. I got some confetti stuck to my finger. Go figure. 47 earlier this morning, 76 was our afternoon high. So a little bit warmer than what we had the past couple of days. And temperatures are going to be up and down quite a bit here for the foreseeable future because the cold front's going to be impacting us tomorrow. Right now we're 69 in Fredericksburg, 77 in Carrizo Springs, and an even comfortable 75 here in San Antonio. And there's a little bit of humidity that's in the air, but it's not that noticeable right now that's gonna change by tomorrow morning. You will notice the humidity for the at least the first half of the day tomorrow. All right, I have some good news for you. The newest drought monitor is in. This is what it looked like three weeks ago when we had extreme drought across a good portion of South Texas. Then you look at today's newest drought monitor and clearly we put a big dent in the drought situation. So that's good, but I still want more rainfall. And tomorrow, I think we'll get some. Just don't get your hopes up for a whole lot of actual accumulation. All right, here's our future cast. And the clouds will be increasing through the night as the humidity rises. The low gray clouds will start to fill in. And I do think they'll squeeze out a little bit of moisture here and there uh, throughout the day tomorrow. Again, not much in terms of accumulation. Don't get your hopes up. It's just going to be kind of a dreary day. A little bit of drizzle possible in the morning and then some hit or miss very light showers through the day. The cold front hits in the early afternoon and that could enhance the rain in a few spots for a brief period, but I, we're not expecting anything uh, really widespread in terms of the rainfall. All right, so tomorrow we're going to start the day at 62. With the low clouds, a few little sprinkles here and there, about a 20 to 30% coverage across South Texas. We'll hit 74 at the noon hour. Then the cold front hits and temperatures drop later in the afternoon and the humidity gets swept away later on in the day. All right, so as we get into the weekend, behind the cold front Saturday, we're looking at a high of only 62. That's the best we can do. 62 for the high, low clouds, a few little spritzes and sprinkles, light showers. That's going to last into very early Sunday morning. And then most of Sunday is going to be sunny and quite warmer from 62 on Saturday to 88 on Sunday with a lot of sunshine. And next week, well, it basically is going to feature what would be typical fiesta weather uh, where a lot of sunshine and temperatures well into the 80s. But Hopefully November will give us a good taste of real fiesta weather as well when we all get back together, reconvene in November. All right, so there's a look at that seven day forecast. All right. Yeah. I, I think he's I think he's getting geared up. I think that's what's happening. I, could, I think I can hear kid, his right, kids' music. Yeah, it's, in the other it's, room. It's, this, will, this will not be a solo project. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, let's go. Let's see it. Yeah. Now you got me. Oh, we just oh there we go. All right, a two camera shoot oh, my inside the Caskey house. Yeah. The Caskeys are here. Hey, show the kids, fam. Show the kids. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Today would normally be Fiesta Fiesta. So, are you ready for some Betty? Yeah! Viva! Come on, I can't hear you. Are you ready for some Betty? Yeah! Viva Fiesta! Viva Fiesta! Yeah. That is awesome. Wow. Awesome. And thank you to the Cassie Kidders for uh, the extra spirit in there. That's awesome. You know what? Yeah. That's that's what we need right now. <laughs> and, I, and I'm guessing I'm guessing the wife said, "Is there any way you can put this on the hardwood floor?" Yeah. Not the carpet. Yeah. Love Adam's it. gonna have some work to do after uh, after the newscast is over. <laughs> Casky crew in full effect there. In case you missed, it's coming up.
Well, in the buzz today, not many people have generated as much buzz lately as a 99 year old World War II veteran from the United Kingdom. Tom Moore from Yorkshire in Northern England raised more than $15 million for the UK's National Health Service by walking 100 lengths of his garden. Moore started his Garden Challenge fundraiser on April 8th. Yeah, in the beginning, he was just going for $1,200 money for staff, volunteers and patients affected by the coronavirus. Moore is turning 100 later this month. He served in the British Army during World War II. Local soldiers actually gave him a guard of honor as he completed the final lap across his garden. That's an awesome story. Yeah, I love that I love one. That. Well, some of these national fill in the blank days have taken on a new meaning since the coronavirus outbreak. Like today, it's actually National Wear Your Pajamas to Work Day. We did not get the memo. No. Yeah, it's something a lot of people are doing while working from home. Yeah, it's supposed to create a laid back, relaxed atmosphere at the office. It started in 2004 as a campaign to reward yourself after a late night of working to file taxes. Taxes usually due on April 15th. The due date to file this year has, of course, been extended until June. Also, because of the coronavirus outbreak, and I did not see anybody in the station today no. wearing their pajamas. No one got the memo. I can't speak for those working <laughs> from home, however. We'll be right back. And thanks so much for watching the 6 o'clock news. We'll see you back here on the Night Beat at 10 and, of course, online at 